Hello. Hello, everybody. Aradhna Tiwari, the founder of Be the Change Page, an Access Consciousness Certified Facilitator, Business Intuitive Coach, and a Leadership Coach. And I'm here uh, to take today's talk show with a very, very dear friend of mine. And uh, I'll go to that talk show. Just before that, I would like to give you the introduction of this page in this place. So Be the Change Page is basically an invitation for all of you to be that change that you truly are here on the planet for. And um, we are invite you with the question every morning here. And we ask you to introspect yourself with this question and see what comes up and what shows up in your world. Because the only person that we don't question is ourselves and we keep looking for answers around the world. But everything is within you and there is something special that you know that nobody else knows. And if you share with the world, the world will be a more brighter and yummier place. So that's the invitation of be the change and come whatsoever, have that courage to be that. So for me, everybody who I invite here is a celebrity. As such, they are already being the celebrity, but special celebrities for me, because they had that courage to show up in the world as what they knew, and they created some change, some difference in the world. So I really have fun talking to all of them, and I get to learn so much, and they inspire me truly in different uh, spaces and possibilities. So, and I come here, share this with you, so that you know you have these inspirational stories, and be behind every celebrity there is the courage that they required. There was a time when they went through bad times and they never gave up, never give up, never give in, never quit. So I just love that attitude. And I want to learn from them that how did they manage then? If they didn't have a problem, did they have an easy life? What was that easy life? And are we allowed to have an easy life? So yes, today's one of my guests, uh, Akshat Bhatt, he's a very dear friend of mine. He has ha had no issues in his life. And yes, easy life is possible, yet he knows so much more beyond life, which probably we are struggling into this life and still do not know. And I would really like to introduce a little bit uh, about him before I invite him. So Akshat Bhatt, who founded Architectural in Discipline in 2007, is a multidisciplinary architect based, practice based in New Delhi, India. His work highlights in the emergence of architectural expression that is contemporary, yet rooted in a critical understanding of regionalism. Architectural discipline works has two qualities not normally associated with one another, scale and intimacy. It integrates a traditional rational approach with cutting edge technology to create spirituality uplifting spaces with spirit and heart. The practice notable projects include the Discovery Center Bengala Bengalaru, sorry, Bengaluru, and the India Pavilion at Hanor Mess and many others. Notable ongoing projects include the refurbishment of the 19th century edits of the Oberoi Grand Kolkata and much more. The firm's work has been critically acclaimed in India by various authorities and has proven its ground each time. So join me in welcoming Akshat. Akshat, can we have you online? Hello, hello. Thank you, thank you, thank you for saying yes to this. And lucky, Not at all. lucky this page that we have your presence here. So yeah, as I was telling my um, uh, viewers here that you are one of the lucky one who never had a problem. And you know, people always say, we have to have problems. And I'm sure we have certain kind of problems, but they're not like problem problems. But yes, you can have an easy life and yet know a lot more about life. So you're a very different invitation for us on this page. And I'm really grateful for you to show up. So I would like you to start your behind the camera celebrity life, what it looks like, how it is, and uh, also talk about your guitar love so that then we come to your work. Okay, so I'm going to correct you. It's not like I have had an easy life. I knew you coming with that somehow. <laughs> I think when I when I look back today, I, I can't believe uh, we've managed to do what we've done. And it it seems like it's been easy but um you know i was uh you know i i am in a very different field from what uh, what my family is right? my family uh, uh my family is just full of academics so uh, no one ever ran no one ever was an entrepreneur no one ever ran, ran a practice or a, or a business of any sort um and <clears throat> I've had my heart abolated when I was 22 years old, which means they burned wow. some parts of my heart because I had, I had arrhythmia and I was in a six hour procedure. Uh, and then when I was 33 or 34, I had a brain stroke. So I was in hospital wow. for 18 odd days and I was paralyzed for, uh, I mean, I was literally paralyzed for two months on half, half, half my side. And I'm still trying to get over that. So I still have 
you know half my face still <clears throat> remains cold and i sometimes walk with a limp and people uh, who know me sort of point that out um but yes i think i've been blessed with some kind of a resolve you know that um, you know when i when i was when i was having the stroke i was told that you know in the guess was that you know i'll be out of work for uh, i'll be out of commission for 6 months at least and i would need at least 2 months before i can start any kind of rehab but i was out of hospital in 18 days or actually 11 days and then 18 before i was back at at the studio although i wasn't allowed to i wore a neck brace and all and i sort of argued with everyone and went out and i was actually and i learned to sketch with my left hand while i was on the second day i was in my hospital and the third day i actually had my studio in hospital so, <laughs> so wow. okay. and and academically yes i mean i the i think the first month i got into hey, it was very hard for me to get into architecture school when i got in i i in the first semester i failed in seven subjects out of nine <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I always say the people who really don't really really study become some big celebrities. <laughs> And you admit so right. <laughs> yeah, well, far from being a celebrity, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, I tell I tell everyone. I think maybe I didn't dream big enough, right? I I dreamt of 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 I, I never dreamt of uh, possessing so many guitars, but I guess it happened. I never dreamt of. being a stud being an architect with a studio like this uh, but it came into being i never thought we would be doing the kind of work we the kind of work we we are doing uh, you know um, but that's a beauty yeah. of you akshar that i've seen that you know you went through so much and that was your statement that you know and i never had a problem like because that is how you kind of didn't pay that attention and you did not make it so significant but how many people do that it's amazing the beauty that you shared with your with us today that you know you did go through it yet you did not make it so significant and that is who you are today and what you are today because you out created yourself each day and you're such a great example for us standing sitting here today with me and like wow out creating your own self and your own capacities but that is such an invitation thank you for that yeah i think it was you know i i remember watching uh, i don't know when it was but i was watching an interview uh uh with uh you know someone was doing an interview with amitabh bachchan and you know i'm not into movies and what not but everybody knows sachin tendulkar everybody knows amitabh bachchan uh and uh, so it was on mtv and it was a fairly sort of it was a very casual interview with a shallow interview like they were you know it wasn't like a prim and proper conversation but the you know the the vj was asking him Uh, you know certain question then what struck me and what sort of stayed with me is that you know he's you know she asked him like what makes you what keeps you going and he said you know the fear of failure i you know and so there are two things right there is a the fear of failure and there is this uh what's it called it's called this i can like it slips me the uh imposter syndrome right so i have i think i have both i i i fear failure i fear, and and it's imposter syndrome i don't believe that i deserve to have to be here and so i have to keep proving to myself that you know no no it's it's or to to everyone around me that no it is really uh this is true and it and it and one deserves it so you're sort of almost punishing yourself in that sense and uh the fear of failure because well yeah it is a fear of failure every time But that is so beautiful you again putting i love the way you put things so easy and comfortable that you know okay that is the fear of failure and that does not let me stop and let me keep going and you know how people hold that oh fear of failure i'm fearful and they hold the fear and said but you're not holding the fear you are even out creating the fear this is like amazing akshar i get you <laughs> you are for what you are is like wow no wonder what an invitation you are i'm already melting my world is already melting at all i never looked at failure that when the whole thing of like you know this is a fear of a failure and that is making me keep going what a gift that is right <laughs> wow yeah. so yeah but i mean yes and no right i mean people tell me that you know my my dad tell me that you know you grew up old right i they te- i i don't know this but i'm told that when i would when i was young i would go to restaurants and i would sit quietly on a table with my fork and knife and wait for the dinner to arrive and then i would eat with the fork and knife and make sure that everything was clean and 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 you know i think i've devolved 
since 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 that time. I haven't evolved since that time. Um, yeah, I mean, it is it is it is what it is. Um, and and how did that take you to the love of your guitars? Like how do, guitars talk, the places talk, the spaces talk. Can you talk a little more about that? Um, so, you know, I've, I you know, my uh, one of my tutors. I think the one who I've stayed in touch with the most and who sort of pushed me was a uh, was a gentleman called Arunav Das Gupta. He's an architect. He's an urban designer, and you know, I flunked, I gloriously flunked one semester. In, I mean, not flunked, but I was like really degraded and demeaned in my second year, first semester. And then in the second year, second, it was Aruna who took me under his wing and said, okay, no, now we see what you do. And I don't know what happened. One thing led to the other, even, you know, in my fifth year, again, he became my thesis guide. And when I finished my thesis project, it was, you know, he, he he said to me that time that, you know, this, what your, your, your project is a, is a demonstration of self-referencing, right? What you can do by just looking at what you believe in as opposed to looking at the world around and sort of, um, you know, and sort of trying to analyze it and sort of lead up to it in a one plus one manner, which I was talking to you about earlier, right? And yeah. I think it came from, I've always sort of had this sort of I've always had I've always had like my feet into worlds or like you know in two directions right so it's always the heavy and the light right or the 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 progressive rock music but you know and the, and but also sort of really simple pop music right and sort of how that comes together and um so how and that how that happened was I think the intensity with how I was looking at things came in through music or through the guitar. I'm not a musician. I'm a guitar player. Okay, I, I'm very clear about that. I I have been obsessed with virtuosic guitar playing, virtuosity on that instrument since I was 13. What what really got you to that? What was that that actually made you feel in so love with guitar and playing guitar? And what what brought like what 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 does what do you get when you actually play a guitar? So, okay, I don't know what brought me to it. I think it was, I had picked up the guitar when I was much younger, but that was the Hawaiian guitar and I got bored of it. Then I was playing the bongos, then I was playing the keyboards. And then, you know, I think around the time when I was 13, uh, we got cable TV. So there was MTV, right? And I was, you know, it was there in the living room. And I, as I was walking out, and I remember that moment, right? I was, as I was walking out, I was in my shorts, I was going to swim. And I suddenly saw, you know, a Guns N' Roses music video it was Slash playing the solo of November Rain. And it was glorious, right? He's standing in front of this chapel and there's, there's, the wind is blowing and his hair is blowing and he's sort of holding his guitar up. And it was, to me, it was just absolutely insane. Uh, it got me and I said, okay, I have to pick up the guitar again. I have to get a guitar. So promptly, uh, I think within a few days and I've, that's something that i've been blessed with right if i've ever gone to my if i whenever i've gone to my parents and said I, I i want this i've got it right like so uh and it's not been like a, it's not like an abundant thing but it's just that you know um if you want it badly enough you want it right and you get it right? somehow and and that's sort of been true like the universe sort of conspires to sort of make it happen and i'm not saying this in a manifestation sort of analogy but i'm, I'm saying it, it really is true so since that time, I, I I picked up the guitar. I learned how to play some Gandhi Rose song because it was cool. It was nothing else. It was very shallow. It was cool. Right? You can impress people with that, like girls with that, and uh, you know, and you basically don't have to study, right? Because you're in the school I band. That. I love that you can impress girls, and then you don't have to study, and to become yeah. the cool, and that becomes your passion, huh? And see, that is also not wrong. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and strangely enough, around the same time is when um, you know this uncle of mine was building. Uh, our house was sort of designing a house. He was an architect and he was, you know, six feet something tall, uh, salt and pepper hair, salt and pepper beard, soft spoken, you know, very, very sort of uh, very distinct mannerisms, you know, even how he would eat his food, how he'd sort of fill every morsel uh, and how he sort of, it was very, very, uh, I mean, it was, it was <clears throat> incredible. I'd never seen anyone like that. Uh, and 
when i went to his house i saw his drawing board you know it was on the floor in those days people would draw on paper and had paddle bars and all that so i basically saw the stationery and i said i want that because that you know it was technical and mechanical and very cool and you know yet it was colorful and that's the sort of contradiction in in all that we do like it's technical mechanical progressive but there's yet there's sort of joy in it right and that's what that drawing board and i'm obviously post rationalizing but but that's what it was and but it is amazing said, that uh, sorry to cut you there but you know a lot of people uh, actually don't see the joy in technicality and joy and the you know the i mean i i just love the way you put things it's like how you put beauty in everything how you pull, uh, you know put kindness in everything like okay this was technical and one side it's like very easy and but there was a joy of doing that too which is so amazing man like how do you get these ideas like how what is it it's like it's inborn capacity of you of having seeing the beauty in everything that is what actually led you to become an architect or is it what um no what i think what what led me to become an architect was also very simple i wanted that drawing board and that stationery so i said uh, what do i have to do to get it so you know it was obviously very very technical stationery so he said you know you have to become an architect and i said that i pronounced i got home and i announced to my grandfather and uh, my family that i'm going to be an architect like we know them to you know and that was it and everybody uh, as an architect in your family right no this was my dad's best friend so i just said i'm going to be an architect like him and that was that it was done uh, also remember that in i mean nobody else would know this but in order to become an architect in those days you had to basically give an aptitude exam which meant you didn't have to study which meant that i had more time to play the guitar <laughs> so i could basically sit on my um you know i could sit on my on my bed side and just play the guitar over and over again for hours right i would play for those days i would like play 20 hours a day with a you know in those days you had cordless phones so you had like a cordless phone talking to you your friends or your girlfriend in one year and sort of playing the guitar you know sort of in another um <laughs> and that was it and i wish you could have recorded that <laughs> <laughs> wow that is so amazing so uh, so could you please talk more around that how this music playing of the music led also helped you in being as an architect as a good architect or like and consciously listening to the whispers of how you listen to the whispers of your guitars and how you go and fetch them from the world and you just know you have to buy them and same with the architect you know how to design it and how to kind of um, it's like uh, weaving together the uh, need and the demand of the client with, along with that futuristic space you know uh, how do you create that is it is it is it related is it how you play your music and how you do your mm, loosely so i think i think what it does is it builds personality right so i tell everyone that you know skills can be taught but character is something you have or you don't have it has to be built over time right wow so i i think what um what music did for me was that you know it just so happened that the music i liked that was sort of a, i had no i had no angst in life i was not a rebel i was none of that but the music i liked was was basically it started with rock but it went on to metal and progressive metal which is very technical music right it's almost it's it's verging to sort of understanding music theory like a classical composer but playing almost acrobatic stunts on your on your on your instrument and that sort of push for excellence and yet it's musical huh? let's not forget there is musical and a joyous right there is all, there is there is happiness in that and a lot of people don't think metal music is happy but i'm telling you that metal music is happy you need to understand the music right it's not just uh, anger and angst a lot of it is anger and angst but a lot of it is it, the same amount of music in that count is also happiness um and of course i you know you know uh, i found van halen and what not which is actually happy music and sort of almost party music but or, or or mr big you know which is party music but really really technically strong so um i think while learning that uh, because in india let's remember that those days there was no the the start what you would study academically was not about you were never analyzing something you were basically given something to read and you would sort of learn it and or, or sort of memorize it or whatever or understand it and regurgitate it right but you were not doing any self rationalized or you know studies or any analysis 
so music allowed me to do that right trying to learn something because there was no youtube those days right i was learning off either from ear or from a magazine or from a friend who was teaching you something and you were sort of stumbling upon it because we had we didn't have any of that you know you would have to go to palika bazaar and buy sort of pirated dvds or pirated video cassettes to sort of learn and the quality was terrible mm. so you were sort of you know i think it is that 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 struggle to get information and uh, and knowledge on something that also teaches you something because you learn from the you know the, the you stumble upon certain things right so it's all chance and what i'm telling you now is also post rationalization i understand it after 25 30 years of doing it it's not like i knew what i was doing when i was doing it it's just by chance so that gave me a certain sense of you know trying to get to this one sort of uh you know almost acrobatic excellence right that how can you do this right and let's not forget that those are the people you like be it a musician or a sports person you are always looking for feats in human achievement no one's ever said oh look at how basic and boring a song they wrote and it's become it's a hit no it's never that right it's it's never oh look at such a basic movie or look at this you know it's just so pleasantly boring right it's never that it's you yeah. know look at how excellent this is and how uh, so so i think by the time i got into architecture school i'd already been doing this for 7 years wow and uh, i'd already been playing for 7 years i was playing live i was playing in studios and so by the time i got in there um, because there was no other way like there was no way you could make make a living from music right you and and i was actually kind of sick of playing you know sort of technical anthems in front of people and you know people just head banging to it thinking it's just it's it's sort of thoughtless metal music right and um so that i led that led me to architecture school and when i got into architecture school through some struggles and what not just about having i got 60 in my board exam right so i just about passed just what made the criteria got in i did not know how to sketch i was terrible at it you know the the person who uh, you know my tutor who taught me uh, uh, for prepared me for admission into architecture school actually told my parents said you know there is no hope for him because he sketches like he has two left hands and no thumbs right <laughs> and uh, and then eventually but she did say that you know i think he has a tremendous aptitude for architecture and that's the only thing he should do um so i got into architecture school and then over there i was just bored silly because everyone was making these brick rooms of 10 feet by 10 feet and putting a tent wall at a, a roof at 10 feet and i was like come on this can't be it like you know i want to play music live and that's what i want to do but i think in my second year when i was sort of shunted into the library that's the first time i opened a real book on architecture and the first building i saw is something that still captivates me um, it was this crazy sort of so it was a very small project it was a, it's called the rooftop extension in vienna by roof by cook camel it was a small office but it was like some kind of crazy fighter plane had crashed into a building and that's what became the office you know and wow. um, and it was a very popular you know project in amongst progressive architecture schools in that at that time so much so that it still captivated me so much that i went to uh vienna uh, i think in 2013 to just see that building right so that was like almost 12 years later that i went to vienna to see that and it was a tiny thing i had to like zoom to that corner with a 400 mm lens to just see it wow that's but that small thing had so much impact on the world of architecture um so what is your work like do you do you build in that and do you, do you do out of the box so what is your forte like i definitely have got this with you that you know how to look the look into the niceness and the yumminess of say it's a metal music say it's a boring project say it's a boring space but you make it so interesting it's just like i would not take metal music and i'm like wow is there a space where there's a joy also in that metal music i mean i have to learn it from you for now but it's like i never looked from that perspective so that's i think your beauty how you actually bring out the beauty in the thing so how do you play that in your architecture and you know um i i don't know but what i what i did realize a few weeks ago and i was i i wrote that down because you know i get these sort of sudden revelations and i then forget so i i told someone also i said look i i i've realized that i design in a stream of consciousness it's like sitting with your guitar right you you sit sometimes your instrument speaks to you sometimes it's your mood sometimes it's your body sometimes it's what you've just heard sometimes what you're thinking right sometimes it's you know your amplifier that's telling you what to but you know and you're reacting to something right so you 
you i i realized that i compose in a stream of consciousness and it's been there from the first project that i get a sense and then i'm struggling to get to that point right to what i sensed as yeah. a pro- as 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 something that needs to happen now it doesn't always have to be some fantastically sort of flamboyant piece you know but it has to be it has to be a very i'm always struggling for or striving for clarity and crispness and that struggle for clarity or that str- that that attempt to get to as much clarity and crispness and simplicity in a project actually is a very complex process wow. yes i definitely we can get that and that expression is what it is so our projects are not a showcase of you know i i say this very often and it might my might sound rude to you know uh, people but i feel that architecture and interior design has become a it's it's you know it's it's become almost this thing of creating a box and then stuffing it with as uh, stuffing it with as many uh, or stuffing it to make it an art gallery a, mati- a stone showroom and a furniture showroom and and maybe a lighting showroom you know and that's it but that's not what architecture is you know our spaces have a sanctity spaces have a soul spaces are what your ha- it's your habitat right it's supposed to nurture you for the next two or three generations you or your family your place of work it's supposed to give you that clarity it's supposed to give you that sense of being optimistic or, or being happy right and let me tell you we use a lot of black i use a lot of black but that black also is because i feel that it makes a surface disappear and allows me to focus on the outside right but if it's white it's sort of reflecting and looking at you black is just absorbing what's hitting it wow i never look that now <laughs> see again how amazingly you brought the black uh, thing out here in the world like we never seen that black like that if for us black is black but you put a new perspective to black too well i sort of i also stumbled upon that right because i was uh, you know when i was younger i would everyone was you know in it's hot in delhi you wear white linen shirts and what not i would go out to sai it would get messy so i'd have to you know you would be sweaty messy dirty but you would in my world you transition between a site and a corporate office very quickly right and in those days i would actually have to go to site now i hardly go to site now but in those days i would have to go to site um and so for me it was easy to get like a black t-shirt or a black shirt and throw on a jacket and walk into a meeting you know you just dust yourself black sort of takes some beating that way right yeah and that's how it started and then uh, over a few months i realized that you know i disappear like i don't see myself in my peripherals so i can really focus on what's in front of me wow so it just helps you disappear right yeah it's not a statement of any sort this black is just because it's it's very it's not even that subah uthke kuch nahi sochna padta it's not like that people say oh you know you're no my wardrobe selection is very difficult because every black is a different black and every every texture is a different texture and every cut is a different cut so you put it together but wow. it's just not noisy right it's just not noisy beautiful that is amazing so how do you put color into people's life with your architecture so i mean i'm sure you do a lot of home projects as well so how you convert uh, and you put your futuristic values into those houses and make them home and also that house uh, or that home belongs to the owners like of course you bring in that architecture aspect from the future as well as combining and getting this whole family into communion so that next 30 40 or four generations or 10 generations can live in that house so is that that you just sense it or how do how do you go about that process so what is what is can you talk a little more consciously uh, what conscious aspects do you perceive there and Mm. so i think um a we don't just make homes right so that's one thing that you know that's always been the cross learning so we learn from a hotel and pass it on to a home or we learn from a home and pass it on to a hotel or you learn from a factory or an industry and pass it on to something so there are a couple of things i believe i believe that you know you know there's that little there's a little story you're taught in school and i can't remember when like good walls make good neighbors right so it is the spaces in between so one is remember that the city happens between buildings yeah well yeah. your yeah. life exists within the building right so yeah. you have to think of what you have to think of how you're responding to the outside to create and what you're doing to the city and that's i think something that's often ignored right that's why we have such terrible skylines that's why we have such terrible street sides that's why we have such a, 
you know, it's not to do with the government not doing something. It's a lot to do with us as well, you know, including the process of how you're constructing. Um, but, and that's, that's actually, that's, that's pure architectural thought, but uh, more than that, I- Can you, you say a little bit more on that aspect for everybody like who's building their houses and you know, how they are just concerned inside and not outside. Can we talk a little bit? Um, well, look, I think for most people, you're looking at that elevation in isolation, right? You're not, and you're trying to make this one statement for yourself, right? You're not thinking of often of what the other guy sees, you know, like what your neighbor sees, what you're doing to your neighbor. Right? Are you creating space in between, which could be shared not, and I'm not saying it as a function, right? Where do you talk, where have, have your chance encounters happened? Your chance encounters happen on the footpath, happen, you know, in a public space. They do not happen in a private space. So private space must be addressed, but public space must be addressed as well, even when you're creating private space. And by creating this one imposing boundary wall and saying, you know, keep everybody out, you're not just creating privacy for yourself, you're also shutting out the city. Wow. And I, I don't, I don't blame people. I think often, I think our cities have failed. They don't really, a large part of them don't offer us something, but I think now it's, we've come to a point where we need to start reinventing them or at least start changing them. We need to be some catalyst for change for, for cities. Um, and how can be that taken care of? Like, how can we change now? Like, I, I think we have to work really hard. Uh, I think we have to work really hard, think about the environment, think about what we're consuming. That's a whole long conversation. It's a very complex conversation in my world, you know. In in and I think that sometimes when you look at it as as a as a layperson, that that might just be a very simple answer, a very simple conversation. But in my world, it's a complex one. Yeah, but what uh, is that one simple word or a sentence that you'd like to give it to our viewers who can at least start working day one from there? Like what? Respect, respect, and consideration. Uh, respect and consideration of everyone. Yeah. And be generous, be generous. Like, what is generosity? Be generous. Uh, if you're generous to everyone around you, it's gonna, it's going, they'll, they'll learn that from you as well, right? I feel they'll react to that. What um, is generosity? Can we talk a little bit in your terms? How it, how do you see that as a generosity when it comes to building your houses, your spaces, and how to involve everyone or engage with everyone? I think I'll have to, I mean, I'm gonna have to. I can't articulate that right now. What I can articulate is what you asked me about future, futuristic stuff and all. Yeah. I can't articulate this at the moment. Maybe I'll be able to articulate in a while, but not right now. Sure, sure. But um, to what you asked me earlier about how do you make a building futuristic? No, and that, you know, I, I, I stay away from that word very often because I think the moment you say future, people start getting these images of robots and sort of sanitized white spaces and very sort of sterile environment. That's not what it is, right? I mean, let's let's not forget that a lot of us still live in buildings that are 50 years old or maybe long, longer. What was done to make sure that they, and a lot of them have lasted 100 years, right? It's not because you've used fancy marble. It's not because, you know, yes, you'll have the one odd piece. So the problem is that each one of us is trying to be a king and make a palace, right? But a house is first a home, right? It has to nurture a family for two or for three generations or more. Yeah. And that has to deal with a certain changing thought, changing aspiration, evolving thought, evolving aspiration, right? Uh, your, it has to groom your mind. It has to be space for your mind first. So if you fill it with things in the very first day, what are you gonna do after 20 years? Then it'll be overstuffed. And yeah. that's the problem I see. If you see, if architecture is not textile design, Right, it's not that right. Your your sari can be beautifully put together. Can have in, a lot of intricate work on it. Yes, and because it's a sari, you'll wear one day. Maybe you'll wear it ten days, and it becomes an heirloom and goes into a, a wardrobe. But this is architecture, something you experience day after day, and you have to see it and and feel it. You know, so the true luxury that you are able to afford is air, light, and space. Right, work towards that, and that doesn't need crazy expensive marble from, you know, across the seven seas. Nice. It needs, it needs something else. And that's, if you strive for simplicity, you'll also start striving for clarity. Wow. And 
if your spaces have that, um, you're all set because this space has to remember nurture you from the time you are, from whatever age you created, till the time you're on, you know, till till the time you can't sort of nurture or create or 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 maintain it anymore, which is till the day you die. Right? So, do you get that it is also related to a person? Uh, day to day, their own thoughts and feelings and emotions, and their houses do represent them. And the you know the architects they choose, or the and the and you know how they brought in that aspect in their houses, along with the architect. Is it somebody's nature? Is it somebody's aspect of how they nurture themselves? Do they nurture their houses? Is it somewhere there or? So I don't think homes are about individuals. I think homes are about families. Families, yeah. Okay. So you have to get a sense of what that family is and what they're going and remember that there's also where you know it's about what they're going to be and remember that they are also today we are constantly bombarded by images on instagram on pinterest on you know whatnot like on journals you see these sort of very image rich content right which is uh it's almost like you know everybody wants to be a superstar right and and everybody is a superstar uh, you know you, you might just be a superstar with three people but and some might be a superstar with three billion people, right? But that is what it is now. How I think I think people are people. Uh, we we tend it's it's the very it's the easy way out to sort of obsess over or to sort of accept someone saying, oh, you know, I'm this and this and this and this and this, and you just keep layering that in. You just keep putting that in. But if you keep putting those things in, all you get is a lot of junk, which you eventually you'll want to get rid of, right? So how, so you have to be discerning, you know, if you, if you need to create distinctive space for every family, then remember that that family also has to, has to grow and, and you'll see that as you start sort of sifting through that, you'll find clarity. I think we often obsess over so much as, oh no, it must be this, or it must be this, it must be so one art from so, so and so, and the canvas must be so large and must be stone from so and so. That creates a sense of dissonance and uh, a sort of a sense of tension in these spaces. So we tend to. So what what in this studio what we try to do is we try to we're always striving for happiness in that space somehow. Now, happiness doesn't mean that the space has to be all white. No, and it doesn't mean it has to be bright colors all over. It's about something else. It's a deeper connection than that. And Sometimes you'll find it through a color, sometimes you'll find it through material, sometimes you'll find it through texture, but most importantly, you find it through space. And that space has to, has to change its expression. You know, the meaning of that space will change for you through different, through different times in your life, right? And I think all of us can sort of pretty much put our lives into like five-year buckets, right? Yeah. Right. India used to have this old five-year development plan. You can put yourself, at least I can. Like I can actually see the five-year buckets. Right? To me, it was a challenge to break the five-year bucket for architecture and, and get up. And... <laughs> so so do, you, do you sense every project that you have done? Do you actually listen to your guitar? Like when you enter that property, like as you individual who created as an architect with your team, do you feel that sense or do you still are not very happy with your projects? I'm never happy. I, I think I'm never happy with a project. I'm, Did you ever listen to that uh, to a string of your guitar? No, no. The, the connection is not that literal, unfortunately. A lot of people have asked me, like, can you relate architecture to music? I say, I can't, you know, it's just, but what, what music does, I think it, it inculcates a certain discipline or a certain, has inculcated a certain process. Um, people collect art. I collect, I don't collect guitars. I, I find them, you know, uh, or they find me. A bit about that, that you find them, because that really intrigues me, and I'm I'm sure it'll intrigue a lot of other people. I I I don't know. Like I think you know, like I have you've had I've, you. Everyone has these sort of aspirations, right? Since they're a child, like I want this. Like it's like a very child. It's a it's a kiddish thing that you know. Oh, you know, I want this instrument, or I want this, and that's what's special about it. So sometimes I'll actually go out and find something special. And it's not like I'll find it immediately, right? There's a guitar that I chased for 17 years wow. that I sold. And then I found it, I sold it in Delhi and I found it in Germany, you know? Wow. Uh, so and there's an instrument that my mother offered to buy for me in 1994. And I sort of 
said oh no no it's terrible i don't want it and then i found myself in 2013 sort of bidding crazily for it on ebay and it was in london and i had it shipped from london to new york and got a friend to carry it in for me so wow. um there's things i found like i saw something in hong kong loved it didn't have the money couldn't buy it uh thought you know came back to india said no no i have to get it tried to procure it couldn't get it and stumbled upon it two years later in singapore there's a guitar i i i saw in singapore in 2006 had no idea that i could ever acquire it or own it or anything uh, loved it didn't have the money walked away and 2012 uh, and i posted on this on my instagram recently 2012 somebody uh dear to me was in singapore and i said you know if you're there can you go to this store and you know and i knew it was going to be 6 years later right so i said i'm just going to send her on a wild goose chase you know, trouble the person walks in there and there's a case there which says akshat so and so like and it was that kid it was there for 6 years in that store in the vault in that store for 6 years waiting for me wow so what what is this that they, these guitars really wait for you and then they come to you what what do you get what is this connection I have no idea. I think it's just. I think sometimes it's just about. You know, there there are some instruments that have songs in them, but there are some instruments which have a story in them. And by story, I mean they teach you something, right? Be it intellectual or emotional, or or they sort of satisfy something in you, right? I never set out to have a collection, you know, be it an, a guitar or a, or a pedal or an amp. i just stumbled upon it like over time so there's something that like, you can't resist it i can't resist it it's like it's like an addiction right i can't resist it i if i ha- if i it's not like i intellectually want it but this is so goes true that something if really loves you will come back to you wherever it is and it's not that it's gone out from your um, sight for once it it doesn't exist in the world anymore it does and it has come to you after 17 years 12 years 6 years 2 years which is like and the same piece which is like that really yeah. amazes me amuses me like wow you know yeah this i mean there's uh, it's you know i don't know what it is i mean i tell everyone you know it is your mind that can also feel right and i think recently they found brain cells in your heart right there was this one uh, discovery and they they have found like a small number of brain cells in your heart so that there, there is like there is that one connection across but I don't know what it is. I think almost every instrument I have is special, and I don't. I'm not saying it that it, I'm not saying it's special to me. It is special. Um, somehow I found them. It's not like I go out looking for special instruments. Uh, I found them at like random guitar stores. I found them in uh, fairs in Thailand. You know, like I found them. through people who just needed some help uh and didn't know what they had in their hand and then i've had to tell them that you know this is and i and i don't i never take something on somebody and not let them know how special that is like i tell them like this is what this is and you're getting rid of it and i don't think it's i i i i'm not i can either give you fair value or not and sometimes i actually like i i tell people like i told a friend he needed some help he wanted to he wasn't just going to take my help he said you know take this instrument and i said it's yours take it back when you're ready for it and you know i gave it back uh, wow. when so what would you say um, akshat like i think i can go on with your stories i always love and i love and converse with you all the time and i go for hours and i just then i'm like oh god okay i i think i've taken enough time of course but you know what is your legacy if what legacy would you like to leave behind in in the world when you go what is life for you and what is your legacy if i may i don't have a legacy So, yeah. I think I think I think my legacy would, if if anything, is left of it, I would say that it could be my studio. Uh, so we're striving to make this studio an equal. It is an equal opportunity practice, but we're trying to eventually make this an equal owner owned practice, right? So I don't own architecture discipline. Nobody owns architecture discipline, but everyone in architecture discipline who's contributed to it owns it in some way. That it's we've sort of it's been a conscious effort for the last few years. i'm blessed in the studio with a great uh, uh you know great team of people the energy here is great i mean i 
I I have to pinch myself often. It's okay. It's not like I'm smiling in the studio all day and I'm not yelling and I'm not angry or I'm not upset. I am, uh, but I do have to often pinch myself. And, I, and I've received that compliment from a lot of people, a lot of our clients. So you're an unbelievable, unbelievable team. I've received that from people who worked with us, have gone abroad, worked in great studios, come back. I've I've heard that from people who lead some of the greatest practices in the in the country, in the world. You've come to us and said, you know, what a studio, and you're really fortunate. And I what, feel that that I'm blessed. What makes it special, Akshay? I don't know. I think it's the people and the enthusiasm and the honesty to work. It is the honesty and the effort and the commitment, right? See, architecture is a leap of faith, and it's a giant leap of faith, right? Remember, it's the most customized thing that you will do for anything. It's creation, creating a physical space. With some, with a lot of sort of cultural relevance, or or and 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 for families, it's an emotional significance, um, and you're creating it from scratch, and they have entrusted that onto you, right? And you have to find the goodness in each one of them. I mean, I think in our twenty years of uh, almost well, in my twenty years of practice and in architecture disciplines, twelve thirteen years. We've only sort of not been able to find that in two, right? And just two, but that's it. But the rest of you know, and and I feel that, and that is, I think, and that quest in the studio is what makes it special because everyone comes in with that sense of sort of ownership, of responsibility, of of knowing that they are part of something special. So, what would you say is a true leader like? So, is that like everybody working in your team is a leader in themselves, or is it that they've been led by somebody? Or how, can you say a little bit before we like close this for today? So, what uh, is that as a leadership? Uh, I I don't think I, well. I don't think it's about. I don't think it's about. Dotting the I. For your people, I think it's about nurturing the ability for them to understand, for them to know how to dot the i. Wow. Um, that is so beautiful. The most dispensable person at architecture discipline, when it comes to a work, to work, is at the moment me. So I am the most useless person here, which is which makes me happy, which means I can actually go home and play my music. You know, that's it. But that's that's the beauty that you trust them and they know what they are gonna gift you. So you've been, I mean, what would you say? Like, I, I what I get is like you let them be. What can they contribute and how can they make that architectural discipline as theirs, not like, like owned by them? So they're the single leaders in their own world, right? Yeah, uh, and the the hope is that I mean, look, the fact is that it's a complex profession, right? It is because you're you're you know the the there is there is a you know, you're, you're bridging. It's a, it's a, it's a profession with sort of almost like it's, it's got huge leaps, right? Because our, our profession has legacy for the last, for the last five thousand years, and it has to take this leap in the future. So these sort of crazy stretches are what a person, an architect, has to sort of has to, has to uh, navigate or negotiate, right? And they have to do it with a, with, with flair. No one wants to see an architect, show, a designer, do something like an accountant, right? Not just that. It has to be. You have to pull a rabbit out of your head some way, and that takes time, you know, because you have to be, you have to know your craft. You have to know how to deal with the worker at site. You know, imagine even the other stretch, right? You're dealing with a daily wage earner who has to deliver something to you, and you're dealing with someone who has the means to engage you. To do a home or a, you know a, a large or a public project or whatever it is, you have on a on a on a public scale project you have a social responsibility, right? So how are you bridging that? Like we're doing a mohalla clinic on one end and we're doing five star hotels at another and we're doing you know modern palaces for people you know which are their houses or homes or villas, you know how do you bridge this? And that is the learning. Uh, it's it's sort of a an attitudinal or a or a sort of character learning 
that is what takes the most amount of time i think in our studio skill sets not a problem we we find that very quickly wow so what is uh, which is your most favorite um, still date project which you think it so represents you and your team which is like which just just makes you joyful that this is something your productors i think i think our first two projects i mean and i'm saying look you you are striving for progress and and sort of uh, excellence on every project right so each one of them is special to us and i'm not saying this in a loose way i'm saying i mean i know everyone says that but i really mean it because we we're not a we're a we're a very involved firm so each project for us needs that level of involvement it requires that amount of commitment once you committed to it at that very moment like if often if people ask me what are you working on today i'll only be able to or what are you working on these days i'll only be able to name that one project that i've sketched out or worked on last i will not be able to name the other 17 20 30 that are in the studio i wouldn't even remember them i'll only know that one moment right and then i'll have to think a while and then I'll, the others will come back so when someone asks me this question you know which is the what is your favorite work i i don't have one i i i don't i dislike all of them equally and that might just be like you know i think there's that correlation with the new testament right that if you don't hate your father it, you well you must love your you don't have to love your father in the same way i love mine but if you don't hate your father in the same way i hate mine you're not worthy of making an evolutionary change so by the time we're done with the project there are so much of it that we hate that we want to improve it right so uh, but i have to say i'm thankful for my first two significant ones which are uh, which are the mana project at ranakpur the hotel and the discovery center at bangalore which uh, which were our first which are which were our first two projects so it gave and i still cannot believe that i was all of 27 when we pulled off those two and the studio was just four people you know wow. or four six people right to to be if you were to ask me to you know how did you do that and can you do that today I, i'm not sure if if i can do that i mean i know the studio can but i'm not sure i can do that today uh so what has been the change for you last not the least for the show what would you like to say what has been the change and what does be the change brings up in your world when you've been asked for that change um i think i mean if if you're asking me for some sort of mantra i don't have one <laughs> No. i just feel what that it, what does it just says to you what does be the change what what does that how would you like people to know and what is your aspect of looking at it what does that be the change should look like or looks like to you i i think it's about uh i think it's about commitment wow oh. and conviction right that's it just i think uh, you you do that and commitment and conviction to what you do is going to lead you uh is going to show you direction in life oh my god how beautifully have you put it's like that commitment and conviction is what is exactly that you required in those tough times i guess uh, you know to be that change but we no, don't remember them but that thank you for putting up that beautiful i love the way you put things so beautifully aksha i can never end up conversations <laughs> with you but thank you so much i think it was such a amazing journey to know about your life and such a inputs from you and i'm sure it contributed to all our viewers here and we'll be keep sharing and please share if you liked it guys with the world and let the world know it's it's just that you can make everything look so beautiful and it's about you it's not about um what people want it's when you bring up and when you allow it, all the energies to contribute it just becomes so beautiful but yeah thank you uh, thank and we would be sharing all the links and how to connect with akshat uh, on the chat anybody wants to get in touch with akshat any specific space akshat people can get in touch with you to mm, you no know, just just i mean i think i'm at b takes pictures on instagram and that's that's it uh, that's good enough awesome thank you akshat thank you so much for this whole conversation and it was a pleasure having you here yeah, and thank you for having me here Thank you, and thank you everybody who was here watching it. Please share with your friends, family, and wonder what more gift can we be. And stay tuned to this page and bringing up more talk shows. If you are creative in your world and you change the world in your own manner, please connect with us. 
we would love to have you on this talk show. And thank you, my team, Sonali, through um, <laughs> Umesh and uh, Shivangi for this. And won't have it possible without your support. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.